Welcome to this final installment of our video series on administrative law. We need to fill out the picture of due process we began last time when we compared Goldberg v. Kelly with Matthews v. Eldridge. Matthews gave us a three-factor test we can apply generally to determine whether an agency procedure complies with the demands of due process. Our vehicle is the case of Board of Regents v. Roth. Roth, the plaintiff, was a teacher at the University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. At the end of his contract term, he was informed that he would not be renewed. No reason was given. Roth sued, alleging, among other things, that he was denied a due process hearing. The Supreme Court held against Roth, not because he was denied some kind of hearing or procedural element of due process, but because Roth had failed to answer the regent's summary judgment motion with factual allegations that he had the kind of interest that due process protects. The due process analysis involves at least two steps. The first question, step one, is there a protectable interest? Only if the answer to this prior question is affirmative will a court proceed to the next step. Step two, what process is due? The due process clauses speak of life, liberty, or property, and Roth had failed to introduce a triable issue of fact as to a deprivation of any of them. Roth's non-renewal was not a death sentence, however much it might damage his career prospects, so he failed to allege a deprivation of life. Liberty is a grand and majestic concept, which encompasses the liberty to engage in the common occupations of life, such as teaching. But Roth does not allege he was denied a teaching license. He alleged only that he had not been renewed in one specific teaching position. He was as free as before to seek other teaching jobs, perhaps with diminished prospects of success. But his non-renewal does not amount to a deprivation of his liberty to look. And there is property. A contract of employment counts as a property interest, but its dimensions are defined by the contract itself, and by its terms, Roth's contract expired at the end of the year. Anything else was mere unrequited hope on his part. The court lectures. Property interests are not created by the Constitution. They're unlike liberty interests in that sense. They are created and defined by an independent source, such as state law or statute. To have a property interest, a person must have more than an abstract need or desire and more than a unilateral expectation. He must instead have a legitimate claim of entitlement. In a companion case, Perry v. Senderman, the court tells us what kind of facts could survive summary judgment. The facts of Perry are very similar to those of Roth. The teacher was not renewed for the following academic year. This teacher, however, had been rehired several years running. There was language in the faculty handbook that a jury might consider as a basis for a property interest. Well, at first the language looks not at all helpful to the plaintiff. Tenure, Odessa College has no tenure system, but there's more. The administration of the college wishes the faculty member to feel that he has permanent tenure as long as his teaching services are satisfactory and as long as he displays a cooperative attitude toward his co-workers and his superiors and as long as he is happy in his work. The Supreme Court held that summary judgment for the defendant was improper because a jury could find that Odessa College had created a legitimate expectation amounting to a property interest. Now all the plaintiff gets is a hearing. We can only wonder what the plaintiff could do to show that he was in fact happy in his work. Smile. Here's a puzzler for you. Unhappy Emory professor asserts due process right to know why contract not renewed. Emory prefers unhappy. Does this teacher get a hearing or even an explanation? The answer is no. For this purpose, Emory is not a state actor, and state, state action is a predicate to due process analysis. 
So let's correct our list of steps. There's a question at the threshold. Is there state action? Private employers do not, generally speaking, count as state actors for due process purposes. A disgruntled employee may have a range of statutory and private law rights, but no due process right to a pre-termination hearing or even an explanation. Well, class, you've made me very happy in my work this semester. All that's left for me to say is to wish you all a very happy holiday. Look for one more short video which will collect our takeaway for this week.